Hello, my name is Peter Allen, and I'm going to be analysing a poem with you called Anne Hathaway. It's written by Carol Ann Duffy, published in 1999 in her collection The World's Wife. It's a poem that gives voice to the wife of William Shakespeare. Anne Hathaway bore him three children, spent all her life in Stratford-on-Avon while he was in London, writing, acting, creating his plays. And we really don't know much about Anne Hathaway. So what Carol Ann Duffy does is give her this unique voice that captures their imagined life together. He was a poet, he was a dramatist. Did she appear in his writings? Did she influence him? Did she inspire him in any way? And what Carol Ann Duffy does in an interesting way with the poem is she begins it with an epigraph, an extract from his will, when he bequeathed to Anne Hathaway his second best bed. And the whole poem, a sonnet, revolves around this concept this idea of their marital bed that they shared together. So this poem by Carol Ann Duffy is called Anne Hathaway. And when we look at the form of the poem, we immediately notice it's got 14 lines. And we call that a sonnet. Now, why did she write this poem in the sonnet form? Well, you need to see Look at who she was married to, William Shakespeare, who wrote poetry and plays and wrote a large number of sonnets. So Caroline Duffy is using the sonnet form for her speaker, Anne Hathaway, in a unique and interesting way, slightly different to the normal traditional sonnet form. But I'd like us now to look at what I call an epigraph. Now, an epigraph is something that you put quotation, comment at the beginning of the poem, and this is it here. And if you read this, it's from, taken from Shakespeare's will. After he's dead, he wrote it, obviously, before he died. And he had made the decision to give his wife, Anne Hathaway, his second best bed. This word, second. And, of course, you've got the word bed in there. I'm just going to look at those two words. Now, a lot of people looking at that would think oh, Shakespeare didn't really value his wife. What's happened to the first bed? He's given her the second best bed. Uh, you might look at the language and think it looks a bit strange. It's just an old spelling form of give and weef to my wife, my second best bed. But let's look at the poem now and see what the speaker, his wife, thinks about him, thinks about that gift of the second best bed and the bed itself. So now we turn to the poem and we look at begins with the bed. It actually ends with bed as well. And also you've got it there. So at least three mentions. There's another bed there. I'll come on to that in a minute. The other one, the contrasting one. But there's the bed that they lived in that they slept in. Is it the second best bed? It says the next best bed, which would be the second best bed, but let's have a look at it now, what she remembers, what she tells us about the world of the bed. Spinning world, look at the excitement of that word, spinning. Literally spins round, but perhaps he's woven in his words, a world where she, her whole head spinning imaginatively and so on. And what does she, what does he conjure up for her? Forests, castles, torchlight, cliff tops, seas. Now, there's a list there of different aspects of life, of love, of imagination. Uh, now, because they're separated by commas, we can call it this little term of asyndeton, because the effect it gives us is mounting, 
giving us more pictures, forest castles, torchlight, clifftop seas, and we carry on to the next line in a minute. But if you look at these, where do they occur? Where do we see forests and castles? Shakespeare's plays. So in talking to her, in perhaps reciting poetry to her, she, he is capturing the world of his, his imagination, the world of his plays with her. And then talks about diving for pearls. That's interesting. Very, quite romantic, really, idea of that. Um, it's, a, it's a line, actually, from Shake, one of Shakespeare's plays, his last play, The Tempest, where he talks, the character, Ariel, says about those are pearls that were his eyes, talking about the father of Ferdinand. So a line from Shakespeare's plays is woven into this poem. Then we've got a little break in the line. Do you see that after the full stop? And we call that, and you'll see a number of these in the poem, a caesura. Okay. So that's the caesura here. So after that word pearls, we pause, and then into this excitement of my lover's words were shooting stars, which fell to earth as kisses. And there we get a metaphor of shooting stars. That's what they've become, that's what they are to her, coming down from heaven, exciting her by their kind of light, by their kind of, they just say glory almost. And when we look at those, we can see the S sounds, and perhaps S sounds here as well, and we can look at that as a form of alliteration, because it's the effect of the alliteration the lovely S sounds and kisses a little softer there, but the shooting stars give the effect of coming down of power of the of the sort of from the heavens. And it's an exciting time for her as she listens to those. Got another caesura there, so we've seen two of those. So after lips. Pauses and then it, my body now softer rhyme. Now it's interesting that word rhyme we've got there. The poem doesn't actually rhyme. Sonnets do. The traditional sonnet does. There are some half rhymes: seas and kisses and world and words. A kind of para rhyme, but that doesn't continue. We don't get rhyme and noun and touch and bed. There's a foot and line. Rhyming lines further on, but let's wait till we get to those. But she talks about softer rhyme. Um, rhyme is a, something pleasing, something that sounds good, something that sort of reflects another rhyme. If one word rhymes with another, it's picking it up. So that's the two of them, because we've got my body, the pronoun, and then his. So the two bodies, so don't forget they're in bed echoing the sound, the feeling, the touch of each of the other, complementing each other. Now I've got the word assonance in there. Now, assonance is a literary technique. It's complementary vowel sounds. So I'm sure you can find some of those in there, here, where the sounds of the vowels are sort of picked up, reflect each other. And that's the, like their bodies, the assonance of them. Assonance could well be in rhyme as well. So that's a key literary word that reflects their love. Now I've got another caesura. Okay. And then we move on to its touch, a verb dancing in the centre of a noun. Now we all know what verbs and nouns are, um, parts of speech. But clearly he's a writer, he needs to use those. And then the poem moves on to something slightly different. It, Finishes there, pauses there with a full stop, and then some nights. So we're on into, if you like, her memory, her dream, her nights in bed with him. And the bed becomes a page, another metaphor. So the bed is where he's writing, not literally, but he's writing from their experience of love. He's writing his dramas involving love, his sonnets involving love. And you see romance and drama. And the lines carry on there, as a number of them do. We call this on Jean Bavon. 
where you get a line carrying on and it needs to carry on because of the and romance and drama played by touch by scent that sense of as she's reliving it as she's thinking about it she's enjoying it so much you don't want to pause after romance and then touch by scent by tape by taste we've got the asyndeton let's refer that down to here as well the commas touch by scent by taste these are how he as a writer um, makes his audience, makes his readers feel the language, um, sort of experience the language through his images. Now, at this point, it's a full stop. And then we get the last four lines. And then we get a contrast. We need it. We need to start, well, not afresh, but start with slightly different tack, the other bed. Wow, it's the best bed. In the middle of the line, that's where she put it, the best bed. Not the second best bed, the best bed. We think that was, yes, of course, the one maybe you give to your wife, uh, their, their marital bed, but it's not. It's the bed reserved for the guests. Now, look at how the language changes here. You've got dozed on, they're sleeping, but they're dozing. They're not experiencing all this, all the kisses and cheating stars, dozing. What a rather sort of dull sort of word, dozing. And then this is dribbling. Their prose. Now we know what prose is, different to poetry. He writes poetry, um, but here we get the guests in their sleep. It's almost as though the prose is coming out of their mouths, another metaphor, really. Um, but not a very pleasant sort of image, this, with that word dribbling. And then another caesura, got plenty of these. And then we move into more alliteration. Three here, my living, laughing love, no commas, just taking the line upwards as she enjoys, she loves him, he loves her, he's created her, perhaps in his poems and dramas, but certainly he can weave the magic of his poetry. And then there's a, there's a, a dash there, a hyphen, just preparing us for the last two lines. And this is where we return to the sonnet form. The last two lines are a rhyming couplet. It's the first time we've got a proper rhyme. It's a masculine rhyme because it's short, single syllables. I'll read them. I hold him in the casket of my widow's head as he held me upon that next best bed. That the monosyllables there, how effective they are, how almost definite they are to finish the poem. It's the next best bed, but we know by now that it's going to be the best bed, really. It's not the next best. She held him and he held me. How they complement each other in the rhyming couplet. And of course, Casket, he's dead after the will. Uh, my widow's head, she's now a widow. Um, but in a sense, a casket is something could have been from one of his plays. So, finally, just talking about the couplets and the couplet form, I've only just got briefly time to mention iambic pentameter. <laughs> look more at this, more in detail, but if you look at Shakespeare, uh, largely he wrote in iambic pentameter, and Caroline Duffy does as well, to reflect the world of Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway. I'll just show you how that works. The bed we loved in was a spinning top. So the bed we loved in was a spinning top. That rise and fall of the two syllables give us, reflects the sonnets of the time. But this is the lover, the wife of Shakespeare, who really re-evaluates for us the second best bed as being the first, the best bed because she shared it with her husband, William Shakespeare.